Hello, my name is Max Colliver and I'm doing an IB film analysis of Guy Ritchie's film Snatch. So this film was directed by Guy Ritchie and produced by Matthew Vaughn, with whom he did Lock Stocks and Two Smoking Barrels previously. Um, this film propelled both their careers and earned them each £9 million, which helped create the film Snatch. Uh, the cinematographer of Snatch was uh, Tim Maurice Jones. And the editor is actually a British Independent Film Award winner, who is also a knight, who also happens to be director John Harris. Uh, the budget for Snatch was around ten million dollars, and the box office was a very impressive eighty-four million US dollars. An interesting fact about this film is that um, after watching Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, Brad Pitt really wanted to star in a Guy Ritchie film, so he called him and wanted a role. Um, Guy Ritchie created uh, the role of a pikey, uh, especially for Brad Pitt, and of course Brad Pitt's um, stardom helped promote um, Snatch, especially in America, as Guy Ritchie wasn't that well known back then in America. Uh, the film Snatch is a very complicated story, so it's very difficult to summarize quickly. Uh, but there are four parallel stories that intertwine with each other until they actually crash during an actual car crash. And the primary goal of all the characters introduced in this introduction is to, um, as he says it best now... Where is the stone? <laughs> yes, that's correct, to find the stone. I will now play the four and a half minute sequence I'm analyzing so you get an idea of the whole picture. What's cool, sir? Hair course. They set two lurchers. They're dogs, before you ask. On a hare. And a hare has to outrun the dogs. So what if it doesn't? What a big rabbit gets fucked, doesn't it? Proper fucked. Yeah, Tommy. Before the Germans get there. Do you know these tits, Errol? I know a lot of tits, Governor. But I don't know any quite as fucking stupid as these two. John? I can't help, Gov. Ah, Tyrone. You silly fat bastard. Well, do you want to do it? That depends. On what? On you. Hey, this kind of a... Ah, uh, not the rouge, but the rules. It's not the same caravan. It's not the same five. So what's the fucking size of the last one? Turkish. The five is twice the size. And my ma still needs a caravan. I like to look after me mad. It's a fair deal. Take it. Mickey, you're lucky we aren't worm food after your last performance. You're buying a Tarts mobile palace is a little fucking rich. So I'm calling your mum a tart. I just meant. Now save your breath and cured your parts. Hey, look, so what's a heck of two roof lights? Uh, the standard size frame furniture and the uh, scarf cushions with the uh, mats and shack by cover. Yeah. Right. It's a terrible parcel to the Paddy Winkle Blue Bags. Have I made myself clear, Bags? Yeah, that's perfectly clear, Mickey, yeah. Just give me one minute to confer with my colleague. Did you understand a single word of what he just said? <laughs> <laughs> i tell you what I'm going to do. <laughs> Fuck it. I bet you for it. You're what? You you bet you for it. it. Well, like Tommy did last time. Do me a favour. I'll do you a favour. You have first me. If I win, I get a card around. And the buyers get a pair of them shoes. <laughs> <laughs> if I lose... <laughs> I'll fuck it. I'll do the fight for free. Now, the last thing I really want to do is better piker. However, I don't really have much of a choice. Somehow, I've got to get him to fight. If I lose, well, I don't even want to think about losing. OK. I reckon the hair gets fucked. What? Proper fuck. <laughs> <laughs> you got that, London. <laughs> hey, we're on! <laughs>
tell you! Yeah, that's off me! I'll tell you what your book is! Periwinkle Blue. Hey, Bex. Who's proper fuck now, then? Um, so first let's start with editing. We may see that the cutting between the locations works on par with the dialogue as normally people would not wait to finish a sentence up until they move to a different um, scene but in this way the editing condenses time and transitions us the audience from one location to another. Um, this also helps us connect with the characters closer as it makes us feel that we are on the entire journey with them. This is very this is a typical Guy Ritchie style and is also evident in his other in his first famous film Lock Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. Um, then there is a simple cut to Vinny and Sol sitting on the ground instead of Bricktop and his comrades. Uh, this transition shows that Turkish and Tommy are on the same level as Vinny and Sol, at least in the eyes of Bricktop. Even though this is not a direct shot of them and is just a recording on a monitor, uh, the camera is looking down at them, uh, putting them in a lesser position of power, which, which um, with the contrast of what Bricktop is saying, um, creates a comical situation. Um, now, this low-angle shot of Bricktop and his um, gang members um, show their position of power. Also, this is in a way a point-of-view shot from the pr perspective of the characters in the monitor. Um, this shot is very similar and is always used when other characters are meant to be killed or, are, or, or Bricktop is very angry at them to show um, his relationship between the characters and Bricktop. Uh, once Ty Tyrone walks in, um, not only is he the dominant because he takes up the majority of the frame, but uh, the focus on him is also reinforced due to the sound and the gang gang's harmonic words. Tyrone, you silly fat bastard. Once again, regarding the power relationship between the characters, we may see that the frame around Turkish and Tommy in this shot is quite loose. However, if we are to look at the shot of the gypsies, we may see that um, it's generally tight, which shows their dominance. Also around the gypsies, it is a slightly low angle shot due to the hill elevation on, on their side. Also, all of them are tall, um, whereas Tommy, who's standing next to Turkish, is small, which once again adds to the comic element of the debate. Uh, the voices of the gypsies are not clear from the start, which makes it easier for the audience to affiliate themselves with the situation that Tommy and Turkish are in. It is also worth noting that the subtitles aren't in the actual theatrical version, they are only in this version that I got of Snatch. So in the actual theatres, people would not comprehend what the gypsies are trying to put across. Uh, once Turkish calls Mickey's mother a tart, the camera immediately dollies in to Mickey and Mickey the Pikey, uh, which makes the shot tighter and reinforces the low angle shot establishing his position of power. Um, to that, the swoosh sound effect intensifies the moment and shows that Mickey is almost preparing into fight mode as all the sounds around slowly fade. Um, also, the slight of the dog growl in the background uh, further shows um, the very hostile atmosphere. Once the frame comes back to Turkish and Tommy, we may also see that um, Turkish and Tommy um, are not directly facing them. You may see that Turkish is facing right above and Tommy is looking directly at Turkish in anticipation of what, what is about to happen. Uh, this contrasts the group of focused pikeys preparing to fight. Uh, once the tension fades away, um, the dolly shot begins to um, dolly out and the original sounds begin to resume. Um, also, it is clear that um, the gang behind Mickey reinforces everything he says um, during their dialogue. Um, this in many ways um, enhances the comical aspect that Richie is trying to achieve uh, using the various sound effects and using um, the sound of dialogue. Turkish's voiceover is typically used when Guy Ritchie has to explain the situation for the detail. Um, Guy Ritchie uses this technique in all his other movies and is a typical uh, movie uh, feature used in Scorsese's films. Um, once Turkish bets Mickey about who will win, whether the dogs or the hare, um, he bets that the hare will lose, which in a way causes a metaphorical... Uh, perception of the story uh, because in in this representation he and Turkish he and Tommy uh, are in the perception of Bricktop the hare 
and um, Bricktop is the dog, um, who Turkish feels will always win against the hare. As he places the bet, energetic music starts and the background noise starts to fade out. Um, this technique in many ways uh, enhances the anticipation of what is about to happen, as this bet is crucial to the situation. Um, however, instead of continuing uh, the action, Guy Ritchie has decided to cut shots uh, to cut to Tyrone, who represents the hare being chased by the wolves. The next camera shot from inside the car cuts to two tough-looking gangsters that look directly ahead of them, ignoring every possible sign of distraction. This gives us, the audience, um, a feel that they are following their predatory instincts as they are looking directly ahead, and it makes it easier for us to affiliate themselves with the to affiliate them with the attack dog. This possible affiliation is confirmed with the next cut to the dogs and the next cut showing the money, making us assume that more people are betting that the dogs will in fact beat the hare represented by Tyrone. Uh, the next transitionary cut between the dogs and Tyrone intertwine the scenes, showing that Tyrone is fleeing from the dogs, which are represented by the gangsters. Um, the walls in this shot around Tyrone, alongside the fact that the shot is tilted, makes the alley much more narrow and creates an effect that is much more difficult. That it is much more difficult to escape. This shot is the cut into the shot portraying the same situation between the hare and the dogs. Uh, the hare is trapped in between the dogs as Tyrone is trapped between the car and the wall. Uh, once Tyrone gets pressed up against the garage door, there is a direct reference to when he was in the video camera, um, which shows that the fate was in their hands or as it was in the previous example on their finger trips. Uh, the proximity of the angle is similar to that of the security camera in the previous example. The cut to the low angle, relatively tight shot of Bricktop and his gang, shows their position of power um, is immediate and ultimate against him. His head barely reaches their feet. We do not hear what Bricktop is saying as his voice is muted, uh, but given the situation and the music, it is clear uh, what they are inquiring of him. Uh, the rotating bird's eye view of Tyrone surrounded by dogs is very fitting as it distorts the perception and makes it more difficult to understand the, the relationship between everyone. Um, this is fitting because it correlates with the shots of between the hare and the dogs from the, the, the long shot uh, in which it is not evident who has the advantage over whom. It is evident that the cuts are a bit faster at the beginning of the chase between the dogs and the hare as the combat intensifies. Um, as the hare is being approached and almost bit by the dog, Tyrone is in fact actually bit by the dog, contrasting the situation. Once he is bit, it is the first time that we hear the voice of the characters in the fight scene, showing that he has clearly lost and is giving himself away to the attackers. If the hare was to do that, he would ultimately die. On the contrary, the hare has won the battle with the dogs at escape, resulting in Turkish and Tommy losing their bet with Mickey. Once Mickey approaches them, um, clear that he has won, the soundtrack stops and the camera dollies in on the faces of Turkish and Tommy show, to show the reaction and surprise to the situation. Uh, Tommy ends up with a phrase that was clearly mentioned before but now is comically fitting in. The ironic part about this whole thing is that even though Turkish and um, Tommy bet that the hair would lose, knowing or subconsciously knowing that they represent the hair with relation to Bricktop, in the end they are the ultimate representation of the hair um, as in the end they beat Bricktop as Bricktop gets killed by Mickey, even though it seemed inevitable um, that they would be the victim, they would be the one who would die, the ones who would die.